I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Have you ever wondered why Nickelodeon seems to be obsessed with slime? If you look up this network, the first thing you'll see is some kind of footage involving slime. You can look back at such nostalgic shows as Double Dare, or maybe watch the latest Kids' Choice Awards. And what's the one thing they have in common? Slime. But where did it come from? Why is Nickelodeon so obsessed with it? Well, I'm glad you didn't ask, because today I want to talk about the first TV show I ever saw. A show that practically created Nickelodeon. One of the first innovative kids shows, and I think the best of all time. A show that has never been replicated, although many have tried. You can't do that on television. Many of you may remember this show, and to those that have never seen it, you missed out on one hell of an experience. This show has been off the air for decades. It's never been released on DVD, and only a few seasons have just begun to stream on Paramount+. Plus. Yet this show will not die. Fans have uploaded episodes online for people to discover, and it's these fans who are the heart of the show. They keep its memory alive. Hell, some episodes that were thought to be lost were found by dedicated fans. It is a show that should never be forgotten. That's why it's a perfect series to cover in this episode of Gone, But Not Forgotten. Thanks for watching Gone But Not Forgotten. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. Now, back to the show. You Can't Do That on Television was created by Roger Price and Jeffrey Darby, originally for the station CJOH-TV in Ottawa. They had to create a kid's show to keep the broadcasting license from the Canadian government. Their decision was to make a sketch comedy show in the vein of Saturday Night Live or Monty Python, but at a very cheap budget. Believe it or not, the show's title was inspired by the iconic George Carlin. While coming up with names for the show, someone mentioned Carlin's classic bit, Seven Words You Can't Say on Television. And from there, Price and Darby's goal was to make a kid's show that went against the grain. They wanted it to be funny, not educational, which was the standard at the time. So what better way to showcase this than by stating what parents would say to kids who ran their own show on TV? You can't do that on television! The show first aired on February 3rd, 1979. Originally, it was a show that aired live, and featured sketches, kids being asked to tell jokes from school, and even call-in contest. Boy, that sure is some 70s hair. What are you gonna show next? Disco dancing? I was just kidding! Uh, moving on. There were only three episodes of the first season I was able to find. And wow, it is so different from the show it eventually became. Now this show was filmed in Canada. Hey Cindy, how'd you like a date tonight with a really good looking boy? Gosh, Tim, I love it. I'll just see if I can find one. Still trying to find a girl, Tim? No, I think I've decided to become a monk. It's funny. I never realized that. But after watching these episodes, I began to pick up on the accents that I missed as a kid. After the first season, Darby and Price cut out all the local stuff and edited together the sketches. Then they began to shop the show around, and it caught the attention of a new kids-oriented network called Nickelodeon. It was pretty evident that the show was a phenomenon from the start, as ratings began to soar. It's been said that if it wasn't for You Can't Do That on Television, Nickelodeon would not have become the juggernaut it became. It was a huge hit with American audiences, and surprisingly, it wasn't shown in Canada that much until 1988, when it was picked up by a Canadian kids network called YTV. The show was so popular that at one point, Nickelodeon was airing it five nights a week. And looking back, the show's success was due to a few factors. First off, the show featured real kids. By that, I mean that these kids were recruited from schools and had no agents. The creators wanted the kids to be as real as possible. It was also important that the young cast were getting A's in school, as they didn't want to be responsible for any child losing out on a good education. The producers had the children go to school on weekdays and come in to film the show on weekends. They would also do table reads with the cast, in which they would take suggestions from the kids on what they found funny. 
Price and Darby were also very open to taking suggestions from the crew as well. They wanted the show to feel like it was run by kids, not adults. This became something that Nickelodeon picked up on, with the network promoting the kids versus adults theme on their advertising and other shows from that point forward. Darby said that little things like the laugh track were even geared for kids. They gathered 200 kids, showed them the episodes, and recorded their laughter. They specifically used those laugh tracks for the show, instead of using the standard canned laughter that is constantly recycled. Gags like pies and other slapstick jokes were also featured on this show. This is where the infamous slime came into play. The origin of the slime came down to a simple accident. In the first season, Darby had a sketch where one of the kids in a dungeon was told not to pull a lever, which of course he did, and then garbage would get poured on him. Darby went to the cafeteria and asked for a bucket of leftovers to be used as something to dump on the kid. Unfortunately, they could not film the scene that week, and had to postpone it. When the time came to do the bit, he was told that there had been a mix-up. Instead of getting new slop, they had instead left the bucket out for a week, and it had now grown green goo all over it. A panic prop master told Darby that they couldn't get new slop in time to use it for the shoot. Darby looked at him for a few seconds, and then said something to the horror of the crew. Dump it on the kid. Tim Douglas was the kid who was sadly the first victim of this, but the viewers loved it. Darby theorizes that this is because most kids were jealous that they weren't on the show. So by seeing the kids get dunked with disgusting slime, they would feel better that they weren't on the show, since they were not victims of something so gross. Darby and Price said that the trigger word, I don't know, was created as a way to make it easy for someone to get slimed. A lot of the cast complained about being slimed so much that the producers would give them an extra 25 bucks every time that they got slimed or had water poured over them. Water was another gag that was used for the entire run of the show. If someone said the word water, they would get a bucket of it poured all over them. There were a few clever moments where someone would say H2O or Agua to avoid it. Other classic bits included the opposite sketch where the kids would turn jokes around and poke fun at adults and life. Some aspects of this show are so iconic that they have been featured on shows today like Robot Chicken and Family Guy. The locker bit is synonymous with the show, which featured the kids saying corny jokes to each other via a locker like you would see in school. Darby and the writers hated doing the locker sketches, because they were hard to write with all the puns. But it was a popular bit, so it was a mainstay of the show. The one thing I will always remember from the series was its iconic theme song and intro. The opening credits were created by Rand McAvore and were greatly influenced by Terry Gilliam from Monty Python. The song featured was the William Tell Overture, and boy, does it get stuck in your head. <laughs> the formula of the show was that each episode would be based on a particular theme, so all the sketches would revolve around it. Most of the episodes were a collection of silly jokes, and I loved them all. I was pretty surprised at how many of them still hold up today. Now Marjorie, do you ever worry about your parents getting a divorce? No, not really. Why not? Because well, I don't think they ever got married. You mean that Girl, <laughs> don't say it! I think that the best episode of this series that showcases how unique this show was featured the theme, Drugs. If we compare the series to another famous kids show, Saved by the Bell, you see the vast differences in writing. Of course, I'm referring to the episode where Jesse gets hooked on caffeine pills. I just need one of these. Pills? You mean you really are taking drugs? I need them. Jesse, give me those. I need them back. I have to sing. Jesse, you can't sing tonight. Yes, I can. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so scared. And the Oscar goes to... Anyway, now compare that to the drug episode on You Can't Do That on Television. Well, listen, I gotta have it. That's tough. Come on, I'll get you the money tomorrow. Forget it. Look, man, I gotta have it. 
Um, all right, kid, I guess so. But it's only because I like you. Oh. Here you go. Oh, thanks. Oh. So instead of treating the topic seriously and it coming off like a joke, they just treat it as a joke. Which does what Saved by the Bell didn't actually making a point about drugs. That using them are just as stupid as wanting a pie in their face. Darby made a good point when he said that that episode of Saved by the Bell was written by adults for kids, while their episode was written by kids for kids. Hence, kids would be more receptive to it. Of course, not every episode was well received though. The episode Divorce was heavily edited in Canada, and the one episode that even the creators felt that they went too far with was adoption. They felt that they were insensitive to adopted kids, mostly because they didn't know anyone who was adopted. So Darby felt it came off as mean and insensitive. I've seen the episode, and there are times where it does come off as a little mean. If you want to adopt Doug, call 555-KIDS. That's 555-KIDS. We'll even give you a cage to keep him in. Please. Nickelodeon only aired this episode twice, but after complaints, it was never rebroadcast. So yeah, banned. But when you speak about you can't do that on television, two people will always be iconic to the show. Abby Haggard and Les Lye. Lye was the engine of the show. He played all the male adult characters in the series, and there were times you could swear it was a different person. His makeup and his delivery were that good. Les was a Canadian actor who had been working in radio and television since 1948. Before You Can't Do That on Television, Lai starred in another children's TV show, Uncle Willie and Floyd. He was much beloved in Canada for his roles and for an entire generation across the globe with his roles on You Can't Do That on Television. He also worked for a non-profit called the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation up until his death. And some of you may have recognized his voice work on such cartoons as Care Bears and Babar. Les played the most memorable characters on the show, like Barth, the sloppy burger cook who would always make the grossest and sometimes deadliest burgers, Ross, the station manager, the drunken dad character, the snooty principal, the Groucho Marx doctor, the frustrated school teacher, and my personal favorite, El Capitano, who was responsible for the firing squad sketches. Lai said that he had so many characters and sketches to perform that he'd often hide scripts on the desk of the teacher sketches, the clipboard whenever he played Ross, and other clever places. I would never have known it if he had never said anything. Many of the cast who went on to pursue a career in acting have credited Les as an inspiration for their decision. He was well loved and took the time to help guide them on their performances on the show. Sadly, he passed away in 2009, and it's a real shame, as he never got to finish writing his memoirs. I would have loved to read about his amazing career. I know that many people, like myself, will never forget him. Abby Haggard was the only other adult on the show. She played all the female adult characters, but she often played the busybody mom in most of the sketches. Haggard often played the straight man to Lies goofy characters. After the show, she did some voice work for Teddy Ruxpin, Care Bears, and many more. Finally, we have to talk about the cast. The show went through 109 cast members. Some of the permanent cast were Christine, Alistair, Lisa, and Adam. Christine McGlade was probably the first ever crush I had on a girl. She looked like the girl next door. She was smart and had a very sarcastic sense of humor. Mostly, she played the straight man to all the madness around her. She was on the show since its beginning and soon became the host of the show until she would leave in 1986. She was just as much of an iconic figure as Les Lye. Whenever I think of the show, she is the first of the cast members that I think of. Lisa Ruddy was pretty goofy and was usually the butt of a lot of the jokes. She was Christine's sidekick and often annoyed the crap out of her. Like Christine, Lisa was on the show from its start. She made me laugh a lot as a kid because she was slimed more than any other cast member. 
She was nicknamed Motormouth, since she tended to talk so much to the annoyance of the others. I thought she had great chemistry with the rest of the rotating cast. Her screams of embarrassment just caused me to laugh and laugh, and she would wind up leaving this show in 1985. Alistair Gillis wound up becoming one of the hosts of the show in 1982. I remember thinking he was cool. He had better delivery than other cast members. Back in the 80s, I always thought he was the coolest dressed cast member. After revisiting the show, I have to say that I was wrong. The opposite was true. Wow. Those clothes were embarrassing. Finally, I have to mention the other cast member that stood out to me, Adam Reed. I think I felt the most kinship with Adam. He was smart and would get out of dangerous and embarrassing situations most of the time. Although he could get beat up a lot and slimed quite a bit. Reed was so talented that Roger Price asked him to become a writer on the show. Other notable cast members that were on the show included Millennium actress Clea Scott and Chuck cast member Vic Shahey, amongst many other cast members who'd go on to have large careers in entertainment, the most famous of them being Alanis Morissette. Despite her being in only five episodes of the show, can you believe how someone who was on the show so briefly would become one of the biggest stars from Canada? I guess that's pretty... ironic? Her most memorable episode of the show was entitled Pop Music, which had her getting slimed. Wow, mega music superstar Alanis Morissette was on an episode called Pop Music? Isn't that... ironic? In one of the gags, she even became a member of a pop band called Green Slime, where she was given a ukulele. Boy, isn't that... ironic? Snap out of it! Uh, sorry about that. When the cast was asked about Alanis, most of them say that she was very driven and special and blah blah blah. She was only in five episodes, so I get the feeling that they're just being nice by saying that. Except for Les Sly. Lai said that during the show they would have going away parties for the kids who couldn't be on the show anymore, since they got too old. He said Alanis would sing them songs, and that he specifically asked Roger Price to give her more work on the show, but that Price replied, That girl has a 30-year-old's brain in a 14-year-old's body. She's too mature for the show. Lai wound up inviting her to perform on another show that he was briefly on. While Lance Morissette has stated that when people tell her they remember her from this show, that they're remembering her brother. She joked that her hair was so bad that she looked like a boy. The series was eventually cancelled in 1990. Nickelodeon wanted to produce their own shows at the time from their new studio in Orlando, Florida. The ratings had begun to go down and many viewers felt that the episodes were not as good as before because there were too many slimes, too many water gags, and other bathroom type humor. Nickelodeon still did air reruns on the weekends until 1994, but after that, it was gone until 2015 when Teen Nick began to air it again. Sadly, the whole show has never been released on DVD or Blu-ray. You can watch a cleaned up version of it on Paramount+, Plus, but it's only the second, third, and fourth seasons. As you can see from my footage, the rest of the episodes are pretty bad quality. I hope that they'll eventually be cleaned up and restored. But I can tell you that you can't do that on television will definitively never come back. There were plans for a return with a new cast in 2017, headed up by original creator Roger Price and producer Jimmy Fox. But in 2019, Fox revealed that the studio that had the contracts of whoever were the rights owners were destroyed in a fire decades ago. So yeah, that's all there is to it. And I'm kind of glad about this. You Can't Do That on Television is a once-in-a-lifetime show. It's so unique and special that it can never be remade. The same factors that made it so great are just not done anymore. If you see the current kid shows, they're all filled with aspiring pop stars or actors. There are no real kids anymore. Everyone is a brand, and that completely goes against the concept of this show. As kids, we used to see this show and believe that we could actually be on it, and now you just can't feel that way anymore. But the series continues to live on with the memory being kept alive by its fans. Many have made websites or made old episodes viewable for free online. They introduce the show to their children, and hopefully when those children grow up, other children may discover it as well. God willing. So if you have a chance, why don't you look for some of these episodes and enjoy the slime. Just don't say those three magic words, because the dry cleaning is expensive.
I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of Dave Arroyo for JoeBlow.com. And thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support. And we will see you next time for the next episode of Gone But Not Forgotten.